Intravenous cannulation is one of the most important skills for junior doctors to be able to perform. In this video, we are going to show you different sizes of cannulas and how this relates to the flow. We're going to do a real-time demonstration of intravenous cannulation. We're going to do a step-by-step -step walkthrough of intravenous cannulation. And we're going to show you how to troubleshoot intravenous cannulation when it doesn't go quite right the first time. The colour of the cannula displays the size of the cannula. Starting with the smallest, blue cannulas are a 22 gauge, pink cannulas are a 20 gauge, green cannulas are 18 gauge, grey cannulas are 16 gauge, and orange cannulas are 14 gauge. The relevance of this is that the flow you can get through a cannula is directly related to the pressure you put putting the fluid through the cannula, but also to the radius of the cannula to the power of four. Therefore, the radius of the cannula is one of the most important factors and the bigger the gauge, the bigger the radius. The flow you can get through a cannula is also inversely related to the length of the cannula. So the longer the cannula, any line that you put into a patient, the harder it will be to put the same amount of fluid through quickly. So to demonstrate this, you can put 60 mils of a fluid through each of these cannulas and see the difference in the flow rates. The difference in flow rate is really important in emergency situations such as resuscitation. A blue cannula can deliver 42 mils per minute, pink cannula 67 mils per minute and a grey cannula 236 mils per minute so it makes a really big difference. Important to note if you add any connectors like bionectors or Y connectors uh, you will restrict the flow rate even through a large cannula like a grey cannula down to that of a pink cannula. Start by washing your hands thoroughly according to your local trust policy before contacting the patient and make sure you're wearing the appropriate PPE of an apron and gloves. That done, apply a tourniquet and ask the patient to pump their fist up and down a few times to encourage blood flow to the distal part of the limb and make sure that the veins enlarge so that you can identify an appropriate target. Clean the skin well with a crisscross pattern for 20 to 30 seconds to make sure the skin is completely sterile and then prepare your cannulation equipment. It's important to make sure that the skin is held tight and that you don't let go of the skin at any point. If you let go of the skin once the needle is through the skin, you will lose the positioning of your needle tip. That done, advance the cannula into the vein until you get flashback in the back of the pub. Retract the needle and see the second flashback through the plastic cannula sheath itself. Advance the cannula and then remove the needle and discard the sharp safely, making sure that you're putting firm pressure on the vein proximal to the tip of the cannula to make sure that there is minimal bleeding back out of the venflon itself while you secure the hub or the bionector or octopus or whatever device you're putting on the end. At this point you can remove the tourniquet if you haven't done already. It is a good idea to generally remove it before fully retracting the needle if you aren't used to how much pressure it takes to fully occlude a vein. You then need to dress the venflon making sure that the steri strips go across the wings, keeping it all in a nice straight line, and apply the dressing covering the insertion site. So the dressing should be right up to the hub of the injection port on the top of the cannula. Once all of this has been done, you get 10 mils of 0.9% saline and flush with a few mils through the venflon. It should be painless, although a cold sensation of fluid going up the arm is normal, and there should be no swelling at the tip of the cannula site. The final step is to apply the date, time and your initials to the cannula dressing. So step by step, wash your hands, apply the tourniquet and identify the site for cannulation, clean the skin thoroughly, hold the skin taut so that you don't have resistance to insertion, Insert the needle tip and the cannula tip into the vein until you get first flashback. Retract the needle to see the second flashback. Advance the plastic cannula into the vein. Remove the tourniquet. Put pressure at the tip of the cannula to prevent bleeding. Remove the needle and discard the sharp safely. Apply your hub or bionectar or octopus at the end of the venflon. Apply your steri strips across the wings and apply the dressing appropriately. Flush the venflon and apply the labelling. So let's take a look at what's happening inside the vein by examining the components of the cannula. There is a metal bevel at the tip of the needle and the plastic cannula itself sits just at the back of this. 
if you attract the needle even a few millimetres into the plastic cannula, then if you advance the entire plastic cannula forward, you're not going to go out the other side of the vein. Alternatively, if you hold the needle completely still inside the vein, then advancing the plastic catheter inside will work equally well. So this is the first approach. Holding the vein steady, you get the tip of the needle into the vein, making sure that the plastic and the bevel are both in the vein, and then retract the needle, leaving the plastic cannula tip in the vein, and then push the whole plastic apparatus forward. This means you won't pop out the other side because the needle is safely withdrawn. The other approach involves once again getting into the vein and then ensuring that both the catheter and the needle are in the vein, holding the needle steady with the thumb and fourth finger and pushing the plastic cannula forwards. A common problem with cannulation is vein transection where you pop the venflon out the other side of the vein once you've punctured it. So you would have initially had your flashback but then the blood isn't flowing anymore when you try and thread the cannula. The solution to this is to pull everything back until you regain the blood flow, lower your angle, and then try and push the cannula up into the vein. If the vein's big enough, it'll usually work. The converse problem would be if you were to get the tip of the needle bevel into the vein, but not get the plastic cannula tip into the vein, and then if you tried to thread the cannula, it wouldn't go because the plastic would be abutting the edge of the vein. The solution is to put the needle forward again, advance everything forward a couple of millimetres, and then try again to advance the cannula. You can maximise your chance of success by picking the right vein to begin with. So you want one that's fairly long, fairly straight, minimal junctions, and is big enough to accept the venflon that you're planning to use. Ideally, you don't want the venflon to be going in across a joint, such as the wrist, as if the patient extends and flexes their wrist, then the tip of the venflon will cause discomfort and also more likely to cause injury to the vein. Big joints are especially a problem, the elbow is notorious for causing kinking of the venflon every time the patient bends their arm. If you go to insert a venflon into a vein that has a junction very closely proximal to where you're going into the vein, you'll probably find that you can't advance the cannula. Remember to choose a long, straight vein, make sure you're not inserting too close to a junction or to a valve, and pay attention to your insertion angle. If you go in too steeply, you'll invariably pop out the back of the vein, causing transection. You probably don't need to go as steeply as you think, and a very shallow approach angle is more than enough to get the bevel of the needle and the tip of the plastic cannula into the vein. And remember, the most important thing is that in an emergency we have access to a big vein for a big cannula. There are very few situations in which a blue or even a pink cannula could possibly belong in the antecubital fossa. Big drips go in big veins. Small drips go in smaller veins. Try and save the large veins in the front of the elbow for the time when you really need them for resuscitation. It's important to make sure that you've dressed the venflon appropriately. So you should make sure that the steri strips are always going across the wings rather than crisscrossing, maintaining the stability of the cannula. Make sure that the cannula is inserted up to the hilt so there's very little tubing outside the skin and that the dressing covers the point where the cannula goes through the skin. All this is to reduce the likelihood of a significant infection in the venflon or the soft tissue.